Thank you very much, Mara. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And Ron described that we're going to have 150 terabytes of data or gigabytes of data. A lot of data is going to come from all these uh, uh, sequencers. And the question I'm going to ask, what about the privacy of these data sets? And I'm going to show you that just using internet tools, and we're going to do it over here during my presentation, we can identify whole genome sequencing data in some cases. So the interest in this uh, um, question goes to the day that I was an undergrad student and I worked as a hacker in computer security company. And credit card services and banks used to invite us to check the robustness of their system. And what I'm going to show you over here is one of my favorite hacks. This is the door to the IT department of a major bank in Israel. Now this door is controlled by a fingerprint reader over here but also by an intercom. This is a very simple device. You just press on the button. It will call to the secretary, and if she knows you, she would press 8, and the relay will open, and you can enter to the department. It is currently 10 p.m. There is no secretary in the building. What I'm going to show you is that each one of you can open this door in five seconds using your own cell phone by playing 8 on your phone. So let's, let's see how it works. Calling to the secretary. Dining eight. And taking the money. <laughs> Don't try this at home, by the way. <laughs> OK, so, so after we do such a process, we can go to the bank and discuss with them about security mechanisms. And by that, we can really improve the robustness of their business. So let's talk about security in whole genome sequencing data. About a decade ago, it has been recognized that there is correlation between Y chromosome and surnames. For instance, if here we have the Smith family and they have a son, then he will get his Y chromosome from his father, and in most Western societies, he will also get his, the surname. Now, if this son is getting married, he will also, and he also has a son, he will transmit his Y chromosome and also his surname. Now, this process will continue and will only break up by non-paternity events, mutations, and explicit surname conversions. Now, this uh, um, idea led to the emergence of recreational genetic genealogy, and now companies offer you to, uh, they will send you a, a swab, you can sample the DNA on your cheek, put it in an envelope with 200 bucks, very important, and you will send it to them, and then they will genotype a series of short tandem repeats, STRs on your Y chromosome, together with your surname and put it in a database over here, for instance, ysearch.org. You can check this database while I'm speaking. And in fact, what you see is these are my own test results that I did last summer. And the reason that you do this, the people do these tests is because that you can connect to your patrilineal relatives and you can find them. It's a lot of fun. Now, about a, a year and a half ago, we read this very interesting uh, article in the Washington Post about a child, a 15-year-old adolescent, that was conceived by anonymous sperm donation. Now, he sent also his own DNA to one of these companies. They genotyped the markers, and they, on, on the database, he found that he has matches to two people with the same surname. So he thought, OK, maybe this is the surname of my father. He also knew what was the exact birth of date of his father, and the hospital that he was born. So he went to Omnitrace. This is a company that uh, uh, focuses on uh, finding missing people. He gave them the surname and these pieces of information. And about a week after that, they were able to tell him who is, who is his biological father. And he was he connected to him. And since then, they're in touch. So the question that when we read that, is this an incident? Or this is something that we can do in, in mo moderate success rate on whole genome sequencing data. So we want to have a systematic investigation of this risk of taking recreational genetic genealogy databases and identifying research participants. So we focus on two databases, smgf.org and ysearch.org. Together, these databases, the, both of them are publicly available and free. You can, again, go from your cell phone, iPad, or computer that you have right now and, and go to this website. They have together 135,000 surname YSTR haplotypes that you can search. So we wanted to evaluate empirically 
what is the success rate in recovering a surname of US males? So we took YSTR haplotypes of real people whom we know their surname. We query these databases and we use an algorithm developed in the lab to infer the surname of this from the genetic data. And then we just compared what we got to see if what we got is, is correct or not. We repeated the process more than 900 times, and what we found that for a US male with Caucasian ancestry, from middle and upper class, we expect to have a 12% chance to recover his surname correctly using this process. But we were, when we did that, we were a bit concerned. Maybe we just get the, the very common surnames, Smith, Williams, Jackson, and there are millions of people in the US with these surnames. It would be very hard to find an individual, even if I know the surname. But in fact, what we found, that the surname, in most cases, is a strong identifier. We recover, in most cases, relatively rare surnames that are found in one in 4,000 individuals in the US. So if I know the surname, I'll go from 150 million males to just 40,000 males, just by knowing the surname. But of course, this is not enough. We want to have a single individual. So then we have this thought process. What would happen if I know also the age and the state of this individual, the year of birth and the state? And according to the HIPAA privacy rule, age and state are not considered identifiers or protected health information. So you expect to find them in some genomic, uh, uh, with some genomic data sets. So we did simulation based on the census data. We picked an age at random, according to the distribution, of course, of males, let's say 40, and then a state based on the population of each state, let's say Colorado, and a surname, Adams. How many people in the US, how many males in the US would match such a profile? We also took into account the covariance between age and state. For instance, in Florida, you have older population. We took that into account. I just don't show that in the slide, in the graphic slide. We repeated this process 100,000 times. And what we found, that age, state, and surname, in more than half of the cases, will give me a profile that would match to 12 males in the US or less. When you have 12 males, every other piece of information will identify this person. In fact, you can just call all the 12 people, ask them, did you participate in this genetic study or not? And you can get the information. It, it's tractable at that scale. Of course, this is simulation. Let me show you a real example. So let's, let's talk about Craig Venter. So we took the genome of Craig Venter from NCBI, and we profiled the, the short angle repeats on his Y chromosome using Lobster, a tool that we developed in the lab and we published about half a year ago in genome research. So for instance, for this marker, DYS458, we found 17 repeats. Okay, so we went to ysearch.org, and for each marker that we found, we just basically inserted the number of repeats over there. And then we clicked search, and after a few seconds, we got that venter is the top match from Craig Venter genome. Now, the nice thing when you do internet studies like that, we just need an internet connection, right? So if you go to this link, bit.ly, Craig underscore Venter underscore haplotype, all in lowercase, from your cell phone or from your, from your uh, uh, laptop right now, it will redirect you to Y search with all the markers that we found. Go, fill the recapture, click search, wait a little bit, and you see that you can replicate what I just showed you during my talk. So let me just summarize this slide. I showed you how we can take whole genome sequencing data and get to a surname. So we got Venter, but I want to see if I can get Craig Venter. Okay, so let's assume that they have this metadata about Venter, his age and uh, uh, the, the state of residency. So if I take v Venter, California, someone that was born in 1946 and a male, and go to ussearch.com and peoplefinders.com, both are public record search engines that you can use them for free, and just insert these four pieces of information, only two records would match this profile. One of them is our friend, Craig J. Venter, over here. And you see even where he was living, and you can get a very detailed report if you pay about, I think, $5 or something like that, but we didn't pay. 
We just use the, the free version. OK. But you know what? Craig Venter, it's nice, but this is, this is cheating, because we knew what, what is the person that we are looking for. Can I do that for anonymous whole genome sequencing data? So we decided to focus on the CU individuals that are part of the 1,000 genomes. We took 10 genomes. We downloaded them from public repositories. We analyzed these genomes with Lobster. We searched the YSTRs in these two databases, and we got certain predictions. Now, in eight out of these 10 cases, the certain predictions were matched to people with Utah ancestry. That's good, but I don't, um, we we're not sure that uh, still we got the, the, right, the right surnames. We focused first on this family over here. This is a three-generation family. All the people that you see here in black are people that are part of the CU study. They have their DNA in Coriel. We recovered the surname of the patrilineal grandfather and the matrilineal grandfather from their genome. We got two surnames for this pedigree. Then we went, now, we're not giving the exact details of the pedigree just to respect the privacy of the family. We went to Google. We did something quite similar. Again, not exactly what, what I'm showing. Simple Google search. What we got? We found an obituary. And the top, and this was the top match in Google, the top link. We found an obituary of a family in Utah that exactly matched the description of this pedigree in Korea. So the number of kids was exactly the same. The birth order of males and females was exactly the same. And remember, this is a big pedigree with a large number of kids. The surname of the father was exactly what we expected. The maiden name of the mother was exactly what we expected based on her father. Both surnames were quite rare, so it's, it's very unlikely that what we found was, was by chance. And also, we checked the ages of some of these people, and again, they were what we expected based on the data on Coriel. We calculated what is the probability that this is a random chance after scanning all households in Utah. And the probability is something like 10 to the power of ridiculous, 10 to minus 5 times 10 to minus 9. Very small probability that this is a random chance. But hey, this is only one family, right? Is this an anecdote? Can I replicate that? And yeah, I want to just, just to finish that. So we, we replicated that with this family. We also found another family using this process, and again, another family, the same approach. All the individuals over here are part of the CU study. And we were able to each one of them, we have an accession number in Coriel to say what is the name based on the search process with very high probability. In fact, we have so much information at that point that we could connect between the people that donated their sample to the recreational genetic genealogy test and between these people in the 1,000 genome. What we found was quite interesting here. The grandson of this guy participated in recreational genealogy, identified his entire family. Here, the second cousin once removed of this guy participated in recreational genealogy, identified the entire family over here. So we can use people that are quite distant from the individual that we are trying to, to identify. So in total, we had five surname recoveries that are successful for sure out of the 10 genomes, and we were able to breach the privacy of close to 50 CAU samples in the 1,000 genomes in the, in the CU panel in Korea. So just to summarize, the approach that I showed you, there is no experimental work over here. You don't need to go to the lab and use pipettes. Some of you were able to replicate it with the internet connection at the venter part while, while I was speaking, I guess. The identifying information propagates via deep genealogical ties. You don't need a matching sample from the same individual. The second cousin, once removed, might be able to identify you if you participated in recreational genetic genealogy testing. And everything over here relies on public resources on it, just internet resources. So I showed you evidence. We, 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 we tested close to 1,000 YSTR haplotypes, and I showed you the identification of Venter and breach of privacy of 50 CU individuals. Now, just to, to finish my talk, Jeanette said in the first day something that just echoed in, in my, my ears. Regulation needs to anticipate the technology. I think in that case, also, you might want to start thinking about if legislation wants to anticipate the technology. And maybe we need to increase the current legislation and to have more in place to be able to better protect 
misuse of genetic data. And with that, I just thank this amazing group of people. Melissa Jimrick, she's the first author, a very talented student in my lab. And for you, for listening, thank you very much.